Hello class members, this is Jim Martin and I want to welcome you to the Big Band Analysis Number 1 class. Um, I want you to print and view the score to follow along. I think we're going to have a, a, a great time going over this chart and then as I mentioned before I'll be writing an arrangement of my own based on some of the things I say but uh, just my viewpoint of how, how uh, I would arrange this, this, uh, this particular tune. So make sure we're, I'm going to be pointing out measures and, and pages and things like that, specific points in the score. So just like you would be sitting in class live, you'll want to have the score in front of you so you can see those things. Now here's some initial thoughts and comments I have about this whole thing. Um, I want you to realize there's never one way of approaching arranging a chart. Obviously everybody has brings their experience and their skill and their their taste and whatever to the, to the table. So um, take all of what I say, the recommendations, kind of with a grain of salt. I mean, some of the things are going to be obvious that we talk about, but other things are going to be very subjective. And uh, I'm basing what I'm going to um, say throughout this class based on my 35 or actually more than 35 years of experience writing for big band or ranging for big band. I first started when I was about 16 or 15 years old, and I listened to some Les Brown arrangements and some, I think, Glenn Miller. And I, what I did was I copied the lead lines off uh, the records, and then I filled in, kind of like a puzzle. I filled in how I thought the, um, you know, using my limited uh, uh, music theory skills, um, I filled in everything, and, and my goal was to have it played and, and, and sound like the record. So that was kind of my first uh, step stepping into the world of arranging by doing some record copies of just some old big band stuff from the 40s. And it sounded pretty good. The guys in the band were very supportive. And I ended up in high school playing with that community band. It was just a bunch of older guys, which maybe many of you are, are in those types of uh, big bands that rehearse, maybe play a gig once a month or something like that. So ultimately, though, you got to make you have to make the decisions based on your experience and, and what your gut tells you, uh, how you should... Um, put those notes on the paper and eventually have them played by players. So best advice I can give you is practice, practice, and practice some more by writing as many charts and arranging as many charts as you can. And that, by getting them played, that will give you a, a really good education. Best one you can get. So my preliminary, preliminary observations of this particular arrangement, I, these are just things right off the top of my head so we can get going on this. First thing I noticed, the very first thing within the first three seconds, there's no style or tempo marking at the very beginning. You have to tell the conductor how fast the chart is going to go, and you have to tell the players what style to play in. So you, uh, I didn't, I was a little confused on where the straight eights were in this chart and where the swing style should be. Some of them are marked, but it's not marked. I guarantee you'll get those questions in the first 30 seconds of rehearsal. You know, do we swing this? What's the feel? Blah, blah, blah. So remember, you don't want questions. You want to head those off at the pass and make sure the information is there for the players. Another thing I noticed right away is that the arrangement is very sectiony, meaning that all the sections, uh, everything's voiced within the section. There's no cross-section writing. And by cross-section, I mean you might have uh, a situation where you have two flugelhorns playing the melody, and you have um, an alto, tenor, and maybe a trombone, or or maybe two altos, or, or one tenor, two altos, two trombones, um, harmonized and, and playing as a smaller ensemble within the group. So that's something to consider, especially in a ballad, and that's something that I may do, I probably will do, in my uh, arrangement of this tune. I noticed that the guitar is marked vocal, and I think he meant guitar down there. So if you look down there... Um, he has vocal mark for piano, but he also but piano is obvious because it's two different uh, staves, treble clef and bass clef. There are no written notes in the piano. I notice, and I think the older I get and the more uh, uh, big band charts I've written, I, st I tend to write more for piano um, within certain sections of the chart. So I think possibly giving the piano player uh, a good idea of what kind of voicings to play along, you know that can go well with the um, the ensemble of what they're doing. It really helps, especially a less experienced piano player. When it, for, for a number of years, for 
a number of years, I was just writing for pros who knew exactly what to play, and I never even worried about putting notes in the piano part. But now, now all different kinds of levels are there. So I want to make sure that the piano player has kind of a guide, and it doesn't hurt to write in some notes for him as well. I noticed another major thing is that the score measure numbers at the bottom need to be much larger than they are. And I actually got called out on this a couple years ago, and uh, my, my score measures were not big enough, and I, I had to make, make double them up to make them at least 24 point or maybe 36 point, and I put squares around them now so anybody can read them when they're rehearsing the band. He has rehearsal letters here, and I think that's a great thing to do, both measure numbers and rehearsal letters. But I would not, on the score, put rehearsal letters on all the sections at the top. I would just put it at the very top and make that as, as big as you can possibly make it for the conductor to see where the letter A, B, and C are. Um, I noticed that he has, looking at the harmony, he has the same chord changes for all of the choruses. Uh, there's, there's no uh, substitutions in there. For instance, look at measure 5 where he has G major 9 going to G sharp diminished 7. That is a uh, that particular spot could be G sharp diminished, but maybe later in the chart you could make it uh, an E altered dominant chord, like E plus 7 sharp 9. So they're, they're both really acting as a 5 chord there. One is just going up by half step. E plus 7 sharp 9 would be an altered dominant going to the A minor 9. So th that's in measure 5, by the way, if you want to look at that. So I would reconsider, and there are spots in the chart I notice where he really should put the chord that is being um, played in the band in the rhythm section. So you really have to make sure that when you write that ensemble out that your rhythm section has basically reflects what the horn players are playing. So uh, we'll get into that as we go along. Um, in the notation area, strive for eight measures per page when you're doing big band. And I, I definitely like this landscape view. Uh, I think landscape view, it's what most, most publishers do is landscape, 8.5 by 11 landscape. So you don't want it to be in portrait view with the, uh, you know, I just like to have a, a wider section so you can get eight measures on there. But look at the first page. He's only got seven measures. So that makes it a little strange um, in that regard. So... Let's move on to some of the more macro parts of the chart, and the big picture things. He's chosen the key of G. It's a standard key for this tune. There are no chord changes. Um, you may want to consider a, core, a, a, a key change, possibly going up a half step or maybe a minor third to B flat. It just depends, and we'll get into more of this uh, choice of key later. I may or may not do this in the key of G. I'm not sure yet. Uh, I haven't decided, but I'm kind of leaning towards another key, which I'll tell you about later. He does this in a ballad style. Uh, as I said, you're, you're going to have straight eights and swing sections, and he needs to really notate that and make sure that the players know what to do there. Uh, the, the entire chart is 69 bars in length. You'll notice that there's two full choruses of the tune, and he has a four-bar intro. Um, he makes use of muted trumpets, harmon and cup, and, and those are a good thing. And uh, he does not have any trombones and mutes. I tend to do the same thing. I use more mutes than the trumpets. Um, I'm a trombone player by trade, and I, I guess I just hated bringing those uh, mutes to, to rehearsal and to gigs, even though I do, but, but I hate it. And I think I, I probably should do more with mutes and the trombones, but I tend to do more in the trumpets. So... Uh, we'll go over some of those things as we get into the chart. He chose two different solo players, the piano and the tenor sax, only for eight bars. Shorter solos are not a bad thing in ballads because, you know, you don't want the guy to be going on for a whole chorus when it's a ballad. So I would, I would, uh, this is not a bad thing have, having eight bars. He may have chosen to do one player, maybe 16 bars, like first two, two, eight, eight, the first two AA up to the bridge or something, but that's just a judgment choice, and he's chosen to do that. So it looks like measure 53. Look at measure 53. That's the climactic point in the chart. And then he comes down to a softer ending. But I notice there's no dynamics written. You'll need to get dynamics into that ending. He's got mutes going in the trumpets, and he's got trombones in the stand. So obviously it's around a piano, but he may want, he want, may want pianissimo there. But you really need to put that in there. 
He makes use of solo trumpet and trombone for the melody. And this is something, remember you have 17 players. You can use one for a melody or you can use the entire band for the melody. Uh, with the lead trumpet being the melody, basically. So the walking bass line throughout uh, had a little problem with that because there's nowhere to go. When you walk the bass line throughout, you can't, you can't create some momentum as the chart unfolds. So we'll get into that as well. I noticed he primarily uses open voicings in the trombones. And I, I did notice some, I did mo notice some uh, voicing issues and some wrong notes in some of the trombones. So I will be getting to those, as I said, when we get to the more of the details. I just wanted to go through a few things that I noticed right off the bat so you could get them in your head and start looking at this music in a, uh, uh, in a way where you look at it uh, from a, a, a way that's, um, what, what's the word I want, uh, from an analytical point of view, obviously. So, Okay, the next lesson we're going to get into more specifics. We're going to be taking a look at the intro, and also we're going to be taking a look at um, the chord changes and some of the um, alternate chord changes you can do for this particular tune. So look for that very soon. And make sure you have this thing printed out as we go along. Talk to you soon.